Welcome, welcome all to a new episode of Bruise and Banter FC. I'm your co-host, Redbeard, joined by the one and only Targo. In today's episode, we will be discussing the highs and lows of Match Week 21 in the Premier League. But the excitement doesn't end there. We shift gears to the Supercopa Final, where El Clasico Titans clashed. And finally, we'll then turn our attention to the FIFA Best Awards. So join us on Bruise and Banter FC for a football-filled extravaganza where the beautiful game comes alive. This episode starts right now. All right, man. How are you? Doing good. What are you drinking on this lovely evening? It is a lovely evening, isn't it? I'm drinking Sierra Nevada Dank Little Thing IPA. It's a hazy IPA. I know you've had it before. This thing, I have. This can, I'm sick and tired of these little tiny cans, man. It's like feels like it's going to take me three sips to finish it. So, oh, buy a pint next time. <laughs> How is it? I'm guessing you've had it before as well. It's a dank little thing. Dank little thing. All it's right. A dank little thing. Very hoppy. Speaking of dank, I have How High Can You Fly Hazy Double IPA <laughs> from Sig Brewing what a in Tacoma, segue. Washington, what a segue. right? I know, you didn't even Love mean it. to set me up for that. That was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I have not had this beer, and it is a full pint. My little tiny thing like yours. Now, is it the 16-ounce or the 19.2-ounce pint? Definitely 16. <laughs> It's pretty good. A good not bad. Yeah. I not my favorite, I would say. Okay. I'd give it a seven and a half. Okay. Was what what's your flavor tasting? I knew you were gonna ask me that. I don't know. I don't know. Like yeah. What flavors am I tasting? Well, I can tell you the hops that are in it. No, nah, it's okay. Mosaic, not, incognito, not that blah, blah, interested. Blah. Spicy eight point three percent. Okay. Does it taste it is, like eight three point three percent? It doesn't. That's it good. doesn't. Yeah. Smooth drinker, but just not my flavor profile, I guess. That's my cup of tea. Or I guess my pint of beer. All right. Well, with that, then, let's get into the matches we had over, I guess, the winter break. Winter break in England's weird. Half the teams go on winter break for two weeks. The other half play games. And then the other half play two weeks later, or a week later, while the other two. Basically, it was one match week split into two weeks. Yeah, pretty much. So we decided we're just going to cover all of it today. So we're going to start with the very first game that happened two weeks ago. Chelsea and Fulham. West London Derby. Chelsea survived a late onslaught to win 1-0. And I'm telling you, man, Fulham would have their chances in this one, but it would be Chelsea who took the lead after Raheem Sterling was fouled in the box just before the half. Cole Palmer would yet again step up and convert a penalty. And you know what? That pretty much was it. Oh, they hit the post a few times, Chelsea. They they Con- did. They hit the post three times, trying to capitalize on the dominance and possession they had. They had a sweet outside the foot volley that hit the post. When he struck that, I didn't think that was going to be anywhere near the goal. And then it somehow hit the post. So it was a beaut. But Chelsea finally moves out of 10th place. They moved In up ninth. to 8th. They're ninth Eighth for the now. time being. Yeah, at that time. Now, which seems like an eternity that they were in 10th place. Yeah. yeah. And honestly, like they've won their last three matches, but not very convincing. 1-0 against Fulham here. A 3-2 win against Luton. 2-1 against Crystal Palace. They're winning, but they don't they... look like a Champions League team, you know, that you expect from Chelsea. They... They're kind of eking out the wins barely against some of these bottom teams. Yeah, I mean, they did have their Carabao Cup semifinal today when as of this recording, and they did win 5-0, but you would expect that against Middlesbrough, so at home. Fulham would probably feel a little unlucky in this one not to have gotten something from the game, but they have one win in their last five now. Yeah, they'll look to bounce back as they play Everton at the end of the month. Yeah. Which both teams desperately needing a win. So, should be interesting. 
Let's move to Tyneside as we had Newcastle playing Manchester City, which Woo! was probably what a game. The best game, in my opinion, of the entire round, I guess. Match week 22, whatever it yeah. was. 21. Uh, City would win this one 3-2, to two, but Newcastle looked in control of this until one thing in this match happened. But we'll get to that in a little bit. <laughs> I know what that one thing is. Ederson would come off injured in the 8th minute. Ortega would come on to replace him, and then City would take the lead through the most sumptuous of touches from Bernardo Silva in the 25th minute. Jeremy Doku would play a wonderful crossfield ball to Kyle Walker, who found Silva to flick the ball into the far post. Lovely back heel, man. I mean, yeah. all the goals in this game were freaking fantastic. But I kind of want to talk about that Ederson injury. Because yeah. Ederson, he gets injured. You know, the, the ball gets played through. I think it was Isaac, whoever it was, was offside. And they continue play. And then at the end of that play, Ederson ends up getting injured. Is that the right call? Like, why shouldn't linesmen just throw up that flag right away when they see a player off sides instead of letting it play out for so long and potentially risking an injury to some of these players? I mean, it's the power of VAR, man. The linesmen have been told to hold their offside flag just in case they got it wrong. It's oh, VAR. I have a whole rant about VAR I'm going to do in this episode, man. Okay. All right. Well, let's get through this so we can give you a little more time to do that. Okay. City would dominate possession, but Newcastle would catch them on the break as Kieran Trippier Twice, man. Twice. Win the ball with a superb sliding tackle. I, I have to say, what a tackle that you was. You know what's even better than that tackle? That ball from Bruno. Bruno Gimaraes, yeah. Over oh, the top of the, the defense. Woo! And Alexander Isak, cool as you like, cuts the ball inside, puts it just inside the post with a wonderful curling effort in the 34th. And then there's their second goal, carbon copy, except Anthony yeah. Gordon. Yep. Deja vu. Isak wins the ball, cuts it in, pops it out to Dan Byrne. He plays it through. Anthony Gordon cuts it back, bends it in the far corner. It's beautiful. And then we had the one moment I was talking about. Our one person. Yeah. Kevin De Bruyne would make his first Premier League appearance of the season in the 69th minute. Second, sorry to correct you, bud. Second Premier League appearance. He came on in the FA Cup. Nope, came on for the first game in the Premier League and got injured. Good shout. His, yep, his second appearance. Good shout. First appearance of 2024. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I couldn't even hold that in. Anyways, just five minutes later, he would make his mark on the match as he would pick the ball up 35 yards out go unopposed and pass it into the bottom. Dude, just slots it. But like the way he (laughs) passes it into the net was beautiful because you think he's going the opposite side from his body position and he just fools everyone, puts it between the defender's legs. Slow as can be, perfectly placed. Kevin DeBrenna, ladies and gentlemen. And then out of the storybooks, man. Kevin De Bruyne did it again as he picks the ball up in the same area. This time, he scoops the ball over the defense to substitute Oscar Bob. Best name the in the most Premier League. Composed finish, dribbles around Dubravka and gave City the lead in extra time. Holy crap, Kevin De Bruyne is back. What a game. What a comeback. Everybody in the Premier League is shaking in their boots. Everyone's on notice now. KDB is yeah. back. He's Goal back. assist. Shout out to Oscar well, Bob. Lovely one might even say man. better than ever. I mean, he said publicly that he's never got a break in football since he started playing. And he had four a four-month break. He said he feels refreshed. So, scary times. But enough about Manchester City. What about Newcastle, man? What is going on? One win in last five. Lost three in a row to Luton. Forest. <laughs> City? Okay, can accept the City one, but next game doesn't get any easier, man, as they go to Villa Park. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to get any easier for them. I mean, looks like Europe is out of the question for next season. Champions League is for it? sure is out. Yeah, I mean, they're sitting in 10th now, taking Chelsea's place. Is Eddie Howe in the hot seat? Potentially. I... Yeah, I mean, he's in the hot seat, but I don't think they should do anything about it quite yet. I would definitely keep him for 
minimum the rest of the season, but it's not looking good, man. There, there's some bad results in there. Like I said, loot, losses to Luton Forest. Yeah. Tenth. I mean, Tenth European position we... is 11 points away from them. Yeah. And they've lost more games than they've won this season, which for them is not good. So with that, I just have one more question for you. Okay, what, what's your question? What team has had the most disappointing season? Newcastle, Chelsea, or Manchester United? Oh, As let me look at the table. 8, 9th, and 10th, respectively. I think I'm going to say Manchester United because of how well they played last season. Won a trophy, finished in a Champions League position. Maybe them or Newcastle, because Newcastle also finished in the Champions League position, made it to final the finals of the Carabao Cup. But I think I'm just going to say Manchester United by how far they've regressed. Newcastle, I can be a little bit more understanding because of the injuries they've had. They've had a lot of injuries. I'm not saying that United hasn't, but I just feel like the way Newcastle play, those injuries have really hurt them. It has. It has. I'm going to go with Chelsea. Because they spent a billion pounds, man. <laughs> a billion we pounds. We po- both picked them to finish top four, too. So, but I, I guess we're being honest. They're finishing about where they finished last season. So, hey. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And I, I mean, honestly, we, at the beginning of the season, I expected United to finish where they're at. Newcastle did not expect it at all. And Chelsea, I mean, I didn't expect them to be this bad. Holy crap. I expected a regression from Newcastle, but yeah, not, not this bad. All right, man. Well, let's go on to Everton, who hosted Aston Villa. This one ended nil-nil. How did Aston Villa go from beating City and Arsenal in a week to drawing Everton and Sheffield United and then losing to Manchester United? Yeah, I mean, as I said in the episode where we covered the United-Villa game, they just look tired, man. The legs are falling off. They don't have enough depth. I mean, you called that. I was saying they would finish in the top four, but you Results were on to something. like this, man, or why I do not think they will finish in the top four. Yeah. And I mean, they're currently, currently they're, they're three in points it points up on Spurs. So the gap is quickly going down. Tottenham are going to get their best players back from injury. They have a couple signings in the January transfer window. Villa yep. do not. Signs are pointing towards Tottenham finishing in the top four and not Villa. So it'd be interesting to see if this two week break has really done them wonders. And we'll see that in the next match day. Yes. I mean, credit to Everton who played well defensively in this game. I just with Everton, man, where the goal is going to come from. DCL missed probably the best opportunity of the game. One on one with Amy Martinez. Martinez (laughs) saves it. I mean, uh, just yeah, the goals, where are they coming from? Yeah, and, you know, their new striker, Beto, has been non-existent all season. So, when Dwight McNeil doesn't show up, they don't score. Or if he's hurt and comes off, comes on as a sub, yeah. But I will say, Dwight McNeil, Jack Harrison, I feel like it's been a really good signing for him. So, it, we'll see. They're in a little bit of trouble here, shall we say, as they could face another point deduction. As they've been charged with financial breaches again, along with Nottingham Forest. <laughs> Premier League regulations stipulate that a club can lose no more than 105 million pounds over a three year period, which they have. Yeah. And could face more points deductions, man. Like, what do you do if you're Everton? Another point deduction? They're barely outside the relegation zone in 17th. I think if they get any more points deducted, that would that would be the death of them. I mean, it's going to depend on how much more. But at the same time, I mean the teams in the bottom three are starting to pick up points slowly, but surely. So it could, I mean, they would lose all momentum they had if they had any, while these other teams are gaining in momentum and they still have to play all three of them. So I, it's going to be tough, man. It's going to be interesting. Get, That's for same sure. with forest. Same with forest. All right. So I'm going to go on my VAR rant now because there's a event in this game. It was Villa had scored a goal that got called back due to offside. The VAR check took over four minutes from when the ball went in the net to when a free kick was taken. 
It was a clear offside. It should not have taken that long. Like it was so bad. Like I went and I like, I like I had to rewind it and I started counting. Okay. How long does it take for them to check this? It's like, they showed the first replay. Oh yeah. There's a player offside top of the screen. And it still just kept going and going four minutes, man, four, not just like a minute, 30 seconds, four minutes for a clear offside. After watching the FA cup before this, I am now a proponent of no VAR. None. Come over. I hated come over it, to man. the dark side, I my hate friend. It. Watching the come FA over to Cup the dark side was such a fresh <laughs> breath of air to watch. Just the game flow. I mean, yes, you'll have mistakes, but you put more of responsibility on the on-field official for him to make the right calls. But it's ones you kind of live with. You're like, oh yeah, in the live, it, it's tough. We don't have the luxury of the replay. Well, now we have the luxury of the replay. It takes four fucking minutes for us to get it right. But then hold on. Half the time, you don't even get it right. It was oh, so, I'm much done, for, I'm so much for voting out automated offsides. That would right? take 15 seconds. I am officially no VAR. Let's go back to the old ways. It, it was uh, less watching complaining. the FA Cup, man. Watching it the FA less Cup complaining. was such a fresh breath of air, like I said. Just watching the game flow, not taking four minutes to watch one little offside that was clear right well i mean this upcoming weekend you got more fa cup games so those of you go watch some fa cup games without var let us know what you think is it better without var let us know on our facebook facebook group 100 percent better in my opinion let, let us know on our youtube channel make sure you like and subscribe hit that notification bell yes yes I guess we'll go on to the, I guess it was my second favorite game. Yeah, of this, this was a week. great game as well. It was Manchester United hosting Tottenham Hotspur. United would take the lead twice in this game, only to be pegged back by Spurs twice. And Timo probably Werner, lost. <laughs> United definitely probably should have lost this game. Yeah, Tottenham were, were the better team. Yeah. Timo Werner made his debut, got an assist for the second goal. But other than the assist, what would you think of Timo Werner? I, so it, for me, it, it's kind of, I'm on both sides of the fence with this one. Both sides. Okay. He, he, after, you know, we've, I've watched him play for Leipzig a little bit this season and watching him play for Chelsea. He looked like he had a weight taken off his shoulders. He's playing with a lot more energy than he has been. Yes. He was pushed off the ball easily. He made a lot of mistakes. There's a couple of shots he had that he should have put on target, <laughs> but he put him in row Z, but for Tottenham fans, having more depth on the outside and up front, I feel like this is a great signing for Tottenham. I feel like he could come good I, in this game. He definitely, I will say, played it safe. Yep. A lot of kind of back passes, probably getting used to the pace of the Premier League again, but he didn't look terrible. He came up with an assist, which obviously has to feel good and hopefully boost his confidence. But there's other issues, man, of this Tottenham team that I'm concerned, but also maybe not concerned. This yeah. makeshift midfield they have of Benton Core, Skip, and Hoiberg, question marks of that midfield. But I got to say, they played really well in that game. And then obviously that attack, man, is missing was missing some key figures. Madison, Son, and Kulisevsky were all out for this game. So we'll see how they... I think once all their players come back, man, Tottenham are going to be a scary team like we saw at the beginning of the season. Yep. I, I think so too, especially once, you know, all three of those players come back. It just shows you what a good manager in Ange Postcoglu, what the difference he can make. Because, I mean, that midfield also played last season for Antonio Conte, and they were awful. Speaking of the phenomenal Ange, how about what he's done with Richarlison, man? <laughs> six goals in six games. I think a lot of that has to do with chances created because they are creating a lot more chances up front, but I will give credit to Richarlison. I've begged on him for so long because he hadn't <laughs> scored goals. He's scoring goals. Now I still can't get over how pissed off he looks all the time and how big his nose is, but you know, that's why it's he does on the that table. Chicken celebration, man, the pigeon celebration, whatever yep. he does is, 
I don't know. It's he's just mocking the Tottenham bird, chicken, cock, whatever you want to call it. There you go. <laughs> whatever that is. But for United, on um, you know, flip side, it was good to see Lissandro Martinez come off the bench, get some play time. Yep. But I have a question for you. Would you United be in a better position if they didn't have the injuries that they do with, you know, Lissandro, Casemiro, Luke Shaw, Malasia, Mason Mount? Like, with those players healthy, do you think they'd be in the same situation or better off? I would say they'd probably be a little bit better off. Why? I just, probably because they'd be more sound defensively. And there's a lot of games this season where they looked in control and gave up bad goals and ended up losing or lo- dropping points. But we know they're real power scoring goals. However, which is where I was going to get to, I think a lot of it has to do with the systems put in place by Ten Hag. So I guess, is it the coach? Because, I mean, it's a... About the same I, I think it's a bit of, as last year. I think it's a and they're worse bit off. of both. Bit of both. And I think they overachieved last season. But I do think it's a bit of both. They're definitely worse off than they were last season. Even if they That's did obvious. overachieve. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. I, I just think the way their defense is playing and the way that they're not scoring goals, although they did get two in this match, and it's nice to see, you know, Hoyland starting to put the ball in the back of the net. But without Marcus Rashford scoring 30 goals a season, this team looks bang average. I so honestly I, think, I think it's both. I honestly don't think they'd be far off from where they are, even if those players were healthy. I think you're right. Defensively, yeah, Lissandro Martinez, Luke Shaw could make a difference, but Casemiro did not look great beginning of the season, even when he wasn't hurt. Mason Mount yeah. has done nothing. Garbage. <laughs> garbage. Malasia is a backup <laughs> player. I mean, so I I honestly don't think they'd be that far off and I think it's I don't know what Ten Hogs tactics. Man, I think it's that. I think it's that. His tactics that he's Yeah. Yeah. Deploying in tactics. This. Man management and I mean, it it's time United. You guys got to do what Arsenal did. Just cut the dead weight free. Let them go for free. Cancel their contracts. Let them go. Take the hit. Because your team will be much better off getting the players out the door that you don't want there anymore. That's all I got to say. All right. Well, let's go on to this relegation six-pointer then. Yeah. Relegation six-pointer. We had Burnley against Luton. And this draw would see Luton climb out of the relegation zone for the time being. In controversial circumstances, as this one ended. Yeah, it was. 1-1. Burnley would have the better of the chances as they would take the lead in the 36th minute after a lightning quick step over by Odebear would find himself free to put in a cross for Ziki Amduni to finish. And man, was that exciting. I didn't know that any Burnley player had that in him. Right. Besides Coley Luton would push to find their equalizer and they finally got it through Colton Morris's head in second half Carlton stoppage Morris. time. But... Yes, thank you, Carlton Morris. Thinking Jordan Morris in my head. Oh, Don't dude. know why. <laughs> yeah, but not without controversy, as Trafford would be impeded by Adebayo, allowing the cross to find Morris for the goal. Was it a foul on Trafford? All right, so I have a whole thing on this one too. So watching it live, <laughs> I did not think it was a foul. I was like, "Oh, that's not a foul." I mean, good, good for you, referee, not bailing the protected species that is the goalkeeper out on this one. Mm-hmm. But then I saw the replay. I was like, oh, VAR is going to overturn this one. That's a foul. He, you can see his hip move towards the goalie. You know, he tries to move into the goalie to push him off. But no. VAR did not call it back. So I, again, first glance, thought it was a foul. Or I didn't think it was a foul. But seeing the replay, I thought it should have been a foul. Yeah. I'm going to go the opposite direction. When I first saw it, I thought it was a foul. But watching it on the replay, yes, slow motion is going to make it look worse than it actually is. I don't think that Adebayo actually saw Trafford. I'll be honest with you. Oh, he definitely sees Trafford and moves towards him. His hip does a little, uh, like his hips don't lie, man. They went towards that goalkeeper. 
to put him off balance. Now, would Trafford well, have gone to the ball in the first place? That's up for debate, I, I, yeah, I would say. That's up for debate. But obviously, VAR didn't see enough to overturn it. So they went with the on-field decision. That's the thing. Was it a clear and it's obvious a- error? Yeah. As you can see, we both are on either side of the fence. So, no, it wouldn't be a clear and obvious error. But <laughs> Vincent Company definitely had something to say about it. I'll tell you. That. <laughs> One of the owners, JJ Watt, had something to say about yeah. it, too, in a tweet. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think he's got enough money in his pocket. He doesn't care about a fine. <laughs> but no. Burnley desperately needed a win as their next four games, they face City, Arsenal, last next three games. Apologies. They face City, Arsenal, and Liverpool. Yeah. That's a rough run of games for them. Luton, now they're only a point away from safety with a game in hand on Everton. And financial, financial breaches. This could be their year, man. It'd be. Everton, Forest lose points. I mean, those are the two teams right above Luton. Mm-hmm. So and, you know, whatever the Premier League and this independent panel finds, it's going to be the new norm because there are a bunch of teams towards the top of the table that are flirting with that line as well. I know Arsenal is one of them, Manchester United, Chelsea, although their summer transfers will have helped them, as in transfers out to Saudi Arabia. But Don't even get started on City, who will probably yeah, be relegated out of existence. If they're yeah, 115. 100, and, oh, yeah. <sighs> It's looking bad. So, speaking of Arsenal, though, let's get to their game, shall we? Okay, okay. We had Arsenal against Crystal Palace. Crystal Palace desperately needing to turn around their form. But Arsenal got the game they needed as they piled the pressure on Roy Hodgson and Crystal Palace, winning 5-0. One team showed up for this game. (laughs) I'll be honest with you, I don't think Arsenal got out of second gear. Maybe Gabriel Martinelli did, but the rest of the team, I don't. it didn't look like it. No. Gabriel, we get the, the scoring started in the 11th minute. Towering header off a of Declan Rice corner. How surprised were you to see that? Weird to see. I was like, when I saw him taking the corner, I was like, huh. Interesting. Yeah. I'd seen pictures of him taking them in their Dubai mini camp, But I did not think that would happen in a game. So, good for Gabriel. He w- Gabriel would also get his second as he Should've... was somehow able to get a header on the yeah. ball. Maybe a yard off the line. It ended up hitting Henderson in the back of the head into his own goal in the 37th minute. But how bad was the defending on this corner? How good were the set pieces for Arsenal? Hmm? Maybe mm-hmm. a little both. I don't know. But yeah, yeah, poor marking. It was awful. I mean, that ball might have been a yard outside the goal the entire way. Even Especially even for that first Gabriel header. He just towered. Over whoever was yeah. marking him. Arsenal would go from back to front in 10 seconds in the 59th minute after a wonderful counter was finished off by Leandro Trossard. Maybe the reason why they signed David Raya. I was about to say, maybe that's why David Raya is playing with that beautiful Ooh. ball out to, I think it was Jesus, or no, it was Havertz. Havertz. Havertz, who then played it to Jesus, mm-hmm. who crossed it for Trossard. Yep. And then. Super sub Gabriel Martinelli would bag a brace with two carbon copy goals just 101 seconds apart at the end of this match as Palace fans would hang banners protesting the Palace ownership. That was something to see. They had a beautiful picture, too, of Roy Hodgson looking on with the away fans there in that banner. Mm -hmm. Questions, man. Questions going on over Roy Hodgson. Which I have one for you. I mean, we know this is Roy Hodgson's last season. He said it. Should he step away now? Right now, as in today, no, I don't think he should. If he does step down or is fired, I think it'll be after their next game when they host Sheffield United. Mm. I think that's a big game that will determine if he stays or leaves. And then what do you make of Graham Potter being in attendance of this game? Do you read that anything was interesting, into that? interesting, wasn't it? I, probably not, no. He was up in the owner's suite. I'm just saying. I mean, do you think Graham Potter would do better with the players that are at Crystal Palace than what Roy Hodgson's no, probably doing? Not. Probably not. I mean, their best player's been in and out of the team all season. It's Abrici Eze and Michael Elise versus the world at this point. So, no. 
it wouldn't do any better in my opinion. And so that's why, like I said, we'll see how he does against Sheffield. Cause I, if they lose that game, I think he could lose his job, but if he can get a win there and put together a few performances and yeah, just give him the rest of the season. Cause I mean, I don't think they will be relegated They're You know, they're in 15th place. They're four points or no five points above relegation. And with these forest Everton breaches, you never know. So I think they'll be fine. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's in their hands at this point. It is. Yeah. So Roy Hodgson can steer the ship as we've seen him do many, many times. They definitely can get some out of it. Speaking of two potential relegation threatened teams, we had Brentford against Nottingham Forest, and we had the return of Ivan Tony. Finally, man, finally. And he yielded Brentford's first win of 2024 <laughs> as they beat Nottingham Forest 3-2. to two. This game was off to a flyer as Danilo would put Forrest in front three minutes in. What a volley that was. Holy cow. Dude, beautiful. Yeah, beautiful volley. Yeah. What were the Brentford defenders doing, though, with that clearance? Dude, it was such a terrible clearance. So, like, it was a terrible first clearance that, like, took the ball backwards into the box. And then Ben Mee tries to head it out. And he, he gets, honestly, not a terrible clearance, I would say. No. But it falls to Danilo, who I think he takes it off his thigh and then just bam. Yep, right inside the post. It was amazing. But Ivan Tony would get his first goal after his eight-month suspension in the 19th minute with his usual antics as he would <laughs> coolly curl his free kick around the wall into the back of the net. But before that even happened, a bit of controversy as he would move the ball while the ref was walking away after he sprayed his line and then move the line to the other he side moved, of the ball. That's the funny part, man. He moves the spray <laughs> over, too. Whether it was intentional or accidental, it's still just hilarious. Moves the it's spray hilarious. and the ball. It's, A good, like, foot. The, yeah. The dark arts of Ivan Tony are back, ladies and gentlemen. And I can't wait to see more of it. I'll be honest with you. But how but, about this, yeah, man? Banned for eight months, comes back, still has more goals than your boy, Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> oh god it makes me so happy <laughs> oh, my oh my goodness yeah anthony what a terrible signing anyways ben me would give brentford the lead in the third just 13 minutes into the second half with a wonderful near post header off of a corner chris wood would continue his hot form with the leveler in the 65th minute after a wonderful cross by callum hudson adoy would find his head for his trademark flick on finish. Which one was better? Ben Mees or Chris Wood's header? I Ben Mees, definitely. Oh, I'm going Chris Wood. Mm, okay. The death Mainly touch, huh? That ball. Well, also the ball from Hudson Adoy. That was spectacular. But to, you know, beat both of those, Neil Womope, take a bow as he would get the winner just three minutes later after his wonderful touch would set himself up for a fantastic volley into the side netting. But however, <laughs> did you think the ball struck his arm? I think it did, man. Turn? I think it did. It's it, obviously it's hard to tell on that replay replay, but I think it it does glance off his arm. It was close. I'll be honest with you during the replays. I couldn't tell. It was it's so hard close. to tell, but I think it did. Just the way the ball bounced up where his arm was either way, whatever. Let him play on. Yeah. I mean, VAR did one good thing. Congrats. <laughs> I'm yeah. over you, VAR. Yeah. Massive win for Brentford as they would jump up the table, giving themselves a cushion off the drop zone after the bad run of form. And Force will feel hard done by this result, but their defending let them down yet again. And Forrest has a tough next trip as they host Arsenal. Yes, they do. Brentford, on the other hand, have to go to Tottenham. Both tough games for both of them, but Brentford sitting six points off the drop forest, just four. So with point deduction looming potentially, potentially. So let's get down to the 20th place team. Speaking of relegation, as we had 20th placed Sheffield United 
hosting West Ham. Maxwell Kofal would get his first goal since August, deputizing for Mohamed Kudus. As Danny Ings' shot would take a massive deflection land at his feet, he would finish near post in the 28th minute. And this game also finished 2-2. I should have said that first. <laughs> you might have, and I just didn't catch it. I don't know, man. Yeah, I didn't. But new signing for Sheffield United, Ben Breton Diaz would get his first goal on his debut 90 seconds before the half as the Chilean international would be the first to react and finish his rebound with some thunder. Dude, you butchered that name. Hot damn. <laughs> Barrington Don't ask me Diaz? how to pronounce it. Barrington. There you go. But you pronounced it weird, no. I feel like. No, I just hesitated. That's what it was. Anyways. Hesitation, man. And, yeah. You saw the word I and was like, what the hell does that say? Yeah. I was like, I swear I, I heard this while watching the match. <laughs> right. I gotta remember. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, West Ham would win a penalty in the 78th minute after some wonderful skill by Danny Ings, who Ooh. probably for me was the player of the match in this one. He'd be brought down by Gustavo. Is it, it's not hammer. I know. It's I don't not. know. Uh, Just say hammer. Hammer. Yeah. Hammer. And it would be put put away by James Ward Prowse. Definite it a pen. Penalty? Yeah, definite pen. Ings gets kicked what in the back of the foot. What a performance by Danny Ings. Holy cow. The footwork too, to win that, that pen. For, yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. And then Graham Brewster would be the first player in this match sent off in the 91st minute after he studs up tackle on Emerson and VR would deem it as sending off after the original booking of a yellow card. This has to be a red, right? Honestly, man, both feet off the ground, studs up, straight legs, crunching tackle. I mean, this is definition late and so much force too, man. He, oh, God. I thought Emerson was out for the rest of the match. He's lucky he didn't catch him high or he would have broke his leg. Yeah. Yeah. One of those terrible tackles that we've seen so many times. Definition of a red. But not to be there. outdone, Vladimir Sofal would be the second player shown a red card in this one after he was sent off for his second yellow in the 97th minute, just three minutes after his first yellow. Dumb. So, not yeah. to be outdone. Yeah. Dumb red card, easily preventable. And then ninth minute of six minutes added on. Sheffield United would be giving a penalty of their own as Ariola would completely miss his attempt to punch the ball and hit McBurney in the side of the head. And he would step up and score in the 103rd minute. Pen for you? Yes, man. Yes. This is similar to what should have been a poet pen. In the Wolves against United game when Onana came out, clattered whoever. Also similar to when Sanchez came out, clattered into Gabriel Jesus. Should have been a penalty. Finally, VAR Mm -hmm. got one right. (laughs) It's about time, man. If a goalkeeper comes out, completely misses the ball, and clatters into a player, yes, that's a penalty. That's a foul. I agree, 100%. But this was the latest goal in Premier League history, as in it was furthest into a match in the 103rd minute. It's crazy. Six minutes record, of added time. They got 13. I think that record will be broken this year. Probably. The way but there would still be going. even more late drama there after was, the 103rd man. minute. This game is drama. West Ham would go straight down the field off the kickoff and have a shout for another penalty of their own as Jared Bowen will be brought down in the box by Medovic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Two players grappling for the ball only for it to be called a handball by Jared Bowen. Should this one have been a penalty? 15 yard penalty for defensive pass interference. <laughs> That's honestly what it looks like. It literally looks like the NFL, man. I mean, how is this not a pen? The defender's back is turned. He's got a handful of shirt hugging Bowen. Man, it was it was a textbook NFL tackle. Wrap it was. Around I don't know what the VR was thinking, how this wasn't a clear and obvious error, unless they're like looking at Bowen as also grabbing the defender and maybe throws himself to the ground. I mean, if you watch the buildup to it, both of them were fighting back and forth. There was a lot of pushing and grabbing. I guess that's what they saw, and that's what they went with because it was on both sides. But, I mean, we've seen this called how many times this season? You got Rodri, 
penalty against Man United. You have the Kukurea foul on Erling Holland. Like this one was so much all the same than shit. that Kukurea f- foul on Holland, man. But yeah, again, his back is turned to the ball. He's not even looking at it. Freaking giving Jared Bowen a bear hug. Yeah. This is this is much worse than any of those. And those were both called for a penalty. Yes. yes. Anyways, I digress. So, let's go higher up the table as we go to the south coast and see Bournemouth taking on Liverpool. So Liverpool would win this one. 4-0 in a stormy night on the south coast. Liverpool will go five points clear at the top of the table and show just how clinical they can be. I'm not saying they are, but they can be. They can be. Yeah. They'd have to wait until the second half to make a breakthrough. As Darwin Nunez would put them in the lead in the 49th minute with a finish as cool as you like. Honestly, this was almost a game of two halves. First half was really very well. back and forth. Liverpool did not look very good. I mean, honestly, I think the four nail scoreline flatters Liverpool a bit. Yes, I, thought I agree. Bournemouth yeah. played well, but couldn't finish and Liverpool did. Yeah, well, they showed him how to finish is Diogo Jota, who is probably, in my opinion, one of the best pure finishers in the Premier League. We put them up. He is such, I got to say, he's just such a good player, too, man, because he can play anywhere along that front three. Like if you saw the first half. I think it was Jota was down the middle, Diaz on the right, Nunez on the left. Yeah. Was not working. Changed it up. Nunez nope. went towards the middle, Diaz on his comfortable left side, and Jota on the right. And Jota just, yeah. Jota can play everywhere, man. He's so good. Yeah. Fantastic. But yeah, he put him up 2 0, 70th minute, as a defensive miscue would allow Gakpo to play him in as he would beat Neto first time to his near post. And then we get the comical version of Diogo Jota. Yeah, that first as he would shot. make a brace just nine minutes later. Does he get a ball a great ball in from Connor Bradley, who I will say was very impressive in this match. Yeah, some youngsters whiff, playing. Completely whiff his first attempt. Like he can't even play that off that he didn't whiff it. No, he whiffed it, it hits off his standing foot and just like jumps in the air and he's like, Pops oh, right there's up. the ball. <laughs> yeah. And he completely fools the entire Bournemouth defense and Neto. And then just cool as you like, puts it in the far post. <laughs> yeah. They'd make it 4-0 as Joe Gomez would get a rare assist. <laughs> and he'd find the feet of Darwin Nunez for a fantastic finish, might I add. To grab his brace. I agree. Score did flatter Liverpool. But what a performance by Alexis McAllister in this match. I know, man. He's playing in the number six role. Like, do you think Tiago comes back in and plays that number six no. role? No. No? Yeah. Not at all. Not at all. I mean, when he's in this sort of form, you can't play anybody over him. But Darwin Nunez coming good of late. He's got 13 goal contributions in 20 Premier League games. Although, he still has missed more clear-cut chances than anybody else in the Premier League. So, I heard some interesting... It was Darwin Nunez is going to benefit from Mo Salah being away because a lot of these Probably. balls that will go to Mo Salah are now going to Nunez. Which yeah, I thought was in the open spaces. Yeah, I, I think so, too. And while well, he's going to get plenty of time as Mo Salah will be out for the next month as he seems to have either strained or torn his hamstring. I don't know which one, but what's interesting is Liverpool, man, they're top of the table. few points clear. In this game, they didn't have Mo Salah, no Endo, no Trent Alexander-Arnold, and still no Andrew Robinson. Robertson. This team is for real, man. They they look yep. good. They are title contenders for sure, and honestly look the favorites to me right now. Yeah, I'm sure Manchester City will have something to say about that with the game in hand, but as of right now, they're easily the most impressive team in the Premier League. I will say that best defense. definitely most consistent, which I guess is what makes you a champion. So best defense and second best offense. Yep. All right. With that, let's get to the most boring game of the entire match day. I will we'll say go this to was Brighton. I would say this was not a boring nil nil draw. No, this one had no, lots of wasn't. chances. 
Just no one could finish. But it had the least <laughs> amount of drama out of all of these it matches. It did. It did have the least amount of drama. But this match would be a clinic of poor finishing and last ditch tackles as it ended nil nil. Both teams with plenty of chances, Brighton with the majority of possession, Wolves looking to counter. But which team's finishing was the more disappointing? That's tough. <laughs> that is tough. Who was more disappointing at the pointy end of the goal? I think I'm going to go with Brighton, probably because they had more chances. But man, okay. Cunha had a hilarious one where he rounds the goalkeeper. He's far out, and he's... At a difficult angle, but he completely shanks it, man. Completely. Not even close. Yeah. I mean, for perspective, of the 19 shots in this match, only seven were on target. Yeah. Sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. And this also, fixture ended 6-0 to Brighton last season. I was honestly, when I was, I saw this one on that was on a Monday, I was like, that's low key. Could be a really good game. Both these teams are playing pretty well. Or at least Brighton play entertaining football. Wolves kind of punching above their weight currently. But no. But it was weird seeing Wolves in the red jersey. Yeah. Yeah, it was very weird. I saw a hilarious comment. It was they were wearing the Portuguese national team jerseys. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably about as close as they I, can get with their colors. So. Right? But it's just I'll, weird because they, they wear that orange that just doesn't clash with anyone. So... They were in something different. <laughs> oh, man. But let's get to the Supercopa de España. This was an El Clasico match, man. Real Madrid, Barcelona. Tasty affair. The sparks always fly, man. And Madrid would put a clinic on Barca on this one. Vinny Jr. with a hat trick. They won 4 1 in and Saudi honest, Arabia. This, or Qatar. Yeah, We're, it's Saudi, Saudi Arabia, right? Saudi Arabia, yeah. But I'll be honest, it's probably the easiest hat trick Vinny Jr. will ever score. <laughs> yeah, a couple of PK, a tap in. I think his first goal was nice. Yes, it was. But I mean, it was poor defending on a high line for Barcelona. So, what was Barca doing with that high line, man? I mean, the first two goals were a direct result of it. It's like they, yeah. I mean, I, I heard, I've heard plenty of commentators and I'll, I guess I'll kind of quote them as well, but they were playing this high line, but no one told the goalkeeper they were doing that because <laughs> the first Vinny Jr. goal, I mean, that ball gets played through and the goalkeeper, I feel like should have came out. Yeah. Ter Stegen played. was on his line the entire time. Oh, it wasn't Ter Stegen. It was a different goalkeeper. Okay. Well, anyways, he was on his line the entire time. He was. He didn't come out. I mean, you, when you play that type of high line, you got to have that Manuel Neuer, Emmy Martinez yeah. kind of player. That's, you need a sweeper keeper. That sweeper so keeper, keeper that's yes. going to be high enough up to where if a ball gets played 30 yards past Vinny Jr. for him to run on it, you're there to clear it. But no, he doesn't even come off his line. Vinny Jr. just runs in, cool as you like, dribbles around him. Nice, easy finish. So I got, I got a question with you. How – well, Vinny Jr. played. Is he a future Ballon d'Or winner? I th I think so. I, I just, I don't understand why Real Madrid doesn't try to push him more into a striker role. Well, I mean, he, he was playing a, a lot more narrow with him and Rodrigo up there in this game. Yeah, so the, I mean, the formation they're playing is more of Rodrigo and Vinny Jr. wide and up front with extra midfielders dropping back into that space with Jude Bellingham more playing as a false nine, I guess. But, I mean, it's working just, good. Vinny Jr. and Rodrigo are definitely playing a lot more narrow than last year because I think that's why yeah. Xavi in this game played Ronald Arroyo out as right back. But Vinny Jr. wasn't really playing as that left winger. He was coming inside because last time they played, Arroyo shut Vinny Jr. down. Shut him down. Yeah. And so Vinny Jr. came inside, and so Arruyo would have to pass him off to Jules Kunde or whoever. And so that's where he was really getting that freedom. Yeah, finding the space in between the defenders, going behind them. What I'm saying is, because Jude Bellingham pushes back further, it allows those wingers to come in, play a lot. Not quite as wide as they have been. They do not play a, a with bit narrower. Yeah, but they're not. It's definitely better, yeah. 
And it, both of the both Rodrigo and Vinny Jr. have definitely benefited from it. So, so let's talk about Barca now, man. Are are they a team in crisis? They're eight, I believe, eight points off leaders. Girona. Let me look real quick. I don't have a La Liga pulled up. So they are six, eight points off Girona, who are in first. They're seven points off Bar or off Real Madrid. Barcelona are this defense has already conceded more goals in La Liga than they did all of last year. Yeah, I, I don't remember last season if they were playing such a high line. They weren't at all. This was something yeah. new from, I, but I, I mean, don't this, know why, why is this defense all of a sudden performing so much worse? Like, I think it's a similar case to that of, Manchester United last season. I think they overperformed, and so the expectations were much higher. And now this season they're being exposed. That and, you know, they have completely new midfield most matches. Each one is a new midfield as one person gets hurt, one person comes back every single match, which exposes that defense a little bit more to more pressure than they're used to seeing. You know what I think it is, man? You kind of nailed it there. It's that midfield. You know what player they're missing? That's not there this season. That was there last season. Sergio Busquets. Yes, he was old, but man, was he cool, calm, collected, and could dominate a midfield. They are missing him. It is showing. He's the orchestrator, man. He was. He was the conductor to that orchestra, man. I think that is why you're seeing what you're seeing this year in Barcelona. It's the sale of Sergio Busquets. Romeo is like... It's not even like seven or eight steps down. It's like 10 to 15 steps down from Sergio Busquets. Well, Romeo's not even playing, man. Well, that's who they signed to replace him, though. It is, but he ain't playing. I mean, in that midfield, they had De Jong, Gundogan, Pedri. That was their kind of None of them are defensive holding midfielders, though. So they all like to get forward. There you go. I mean, is Javi the long-term solution for Barcelona, or is this something they should look to move on from? I, I would give him probably one more year, see what if they can balance their books and get a little more wiggle room in the summer to sign someone that could play in that defensive midfield role. But if they don't get it, man, I no, he's not. Okay. Well, that was our Super Copa thoughts let's move on to the fifa best awards that occurred last week so these awards this is to judge the judging for these awards it was from december 19th 2022 to august 20th 2023 so this is after the world cup the world cup is not supposed to factor in these awards so let's go through them okay we'll we'll start at the fan award Okay. This one was a father who bottle fed a newborn son at a match in Argentina. <laughs> it was fantastic. Fair play award went to Brazil's national team for their efforts fighting racism. Yeah. And then we had the men's world 11 had six man city players included. The lineup was Thibaut Courtois for in goal, John Stones, Ruben Diaz, Kyle Walker, and defense. So all Man City. The midfield mm-hmm. had Bernardo Silva, Jude Bellingham, and Kevin De Bruyne. And in attack, it had Erling Holland, Kylian Mbappe, Lionel Messi, and Vinny Jr. Not the men's World Eleven I would have picked. Me neither. But they're starting to look sound like me with these odd formations they're picking. <laughs> Four up front, really? You just had to get, you know. Messi and Vinny Jr. in the same team, I guess. Apparently, yeah, not not the not the eleven I would have gone with. I don't know, Kyle Walker, the best right back. Eh. Jude Bellingham, really only blew I mean, John, up after John Stones you know, the season wasn't even started for half of that. So, so that's an interesting one. The Puskas Award went to Guillerme Madruga, crazy bicycle kick in some Brazilian league. If you haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. Look it up. The women's goalkeeper went to Mary Earps of Manchester United. The men's goalkeeper went to Ederson. So Ederson won best goalkeeper, I, but not in the men's World Eleven. I don't understand it. 
It's the same concept as Emmy Martinez winning best goalkeeper. In the no one understands awards. it. That's why these but awards the... are shit, man. They're, it's, it's, yeah. It's a big political mess. Women's coach went to Serena Wegman from the England national team. Men's coach Pep Guardiola from Manchester yeah. City. You win a treble, you're going to win manager of the year. Yeah, pretty much. Women's player Aitana Bonmati from Barcelona. And the one everyone was looking at, the men's player of the year, Lionel Messi with the win. Yeah, and I know you said before this even started, it's not supposed to include the World Cup because the World Cup happened after August 20th. After December 19th, yes. Yeah. So this award, you got a lot of it's captains of national teams, coaches, things like that, that vote on it. And Messi and Holland actually tied on votes for first, but Messi had more first place votes than Holland. Do you think the players knew this was not supposed to include the World Cup? Probably. I don't yeah. think they did. I think so. Oh, you, oh, sorry. Did they know as in like in their voting it shouldn't have counted? Yes. No, you were right. I don't think that it they knew at all because I mean you looked at everybody's voting and he was number one. For quite a few, yeah. I like Van Dyke had him as number one, other various I can't remember them all. But yeah. they had him as his number one. I mean, Messi, his votes, they showed his. It went Holland, Mbappe, Alvarez for his top three. Yeah. Which, you know, I would have been perfectly okay with. I think that, I think Holland and Mbappe, yeah, should have been the one and two, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, since the World Cup, let's be honest, what has Messi really done? He won a trophy in MLS. Yeah, he won. You want a trophy in MLS, but for Europeans, that's like Doesn't giving matter. candy to a baby. Holland won a Premier League, FA Cup, Champions League. You know, he had the golden boot. Well, actually, Cristiano Ronaldo had the golden boot, but he plays in a farmer's year. league. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he broke records, conqueror of worlds, first of his name, winner of trophies. Breaker Slayer records. of goals, yeah, all of it. Slayer of goals. I think we can both agree Erling Holland should have won Erling this award. Holland. Yeah, and I'm personally I'm super disappointed because the FIFA Best Awards is supposed to be like the anti Ballon d'Or, where like the person who deserves to win wins. And this I, was not it this season. I'm guessing they just like the players get this as an email or something they got to fill out, and they just say, "Oh, Messi's on there." Yeah, sure. They don't know when the dates are of what this is supposed well, to encompass. I, I don't. I don't even think that there's a list. I think they just have to fill it out. Probably for the best three picks. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Probably not the, not the best award show done. But hopefully, it'll be better next year. Yeah, I think Messi being in MLS for now a full year when these awards start to come out, when the Ballon d'Or comes out, we'll see a little bit fairer results. I hope so. One but can only hope. That does it for us today, my friends. Who do you guys think should have won the men's best player? Leo Messi deserve it. Should have been Erling Brut Holland. Let us know. Make sure you're following our Facebook page, our Facebook group. Make sure you join that, get the conversation going. Follow our YouTube channel. Hit that notification bell. Like, subscribe. And make sure to check out our Redbubble. We got some pretty awesome merch, man. Look at that. The Bruising Banter FC and the mugs and the Henri Icon. Just right. saying. Yeah. It's pretty, right pretty great. Yep. Right there. So... Make sure you go check that out. But till next time, my friends. Cheers.